Our first main presenter, Janelle Austin, is co-founder and lead caretaker of the George Floyd Global Memorial, where she guides a team of volunteers to stand in the unique space of preservation and protest. She is also the creator of Racial Agency Initiative, a racial justice leadership coaching company. She began tending to George Floyd's memorial during the first week of the Minneapolis uprising as a form of social resistance and self-care. Every day the memorial looked different and every day she and others would tend to both the new and old offerings so that the story could be preserved. Into her background, Janelle earned a Bachelor's of Arts in Christian Ministries from Messiah College and a Master's of Divinity and Ethics and a Master of Arts in Intercultural Studies from Fuller Theological Seminary. She consults and speaks nationwide on various topics as they intersect with race in America. A native resident of Minneapolis, Janelle continues to serve and be supported by the people in her community. Our second presenter or our co-presenter for tonight is Akoma Gaither. She is a public historian, currently a graduate student at the University of Minnesota, working on her master's in heritage studies and public history. And ladies, take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are so excited to be with you today um, and to co-present as uh, representatives from the George Floyd Global Memorial here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I'm Janelle Austin, as the little tag says in the bottom of the screen. Um, and uh, right next to me, uh, not in real life, but on the screen is uh, Akoma Gaither, uh, who is our uh, fellow uh, a racial justice uh, conservation care fellow. I think I messed that up, Akoma. What's the collections what care fellow? It collections cool. care fellow. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, it's her, her presence here has been a huge help in actually getting down to the nitty gritty of actually doing um, conservation care for the offerings that have been laid at the memorial. Um, and so uh, as a reminder, the title of our talk today is Telling Our Own Story, uh, The Threat of Whiteness in Conservation. And uh, in this choosing this title was very significant and important, uh, we felt, because as we go through this work of, of building a rememory out of the protest, um, and being introduced to the entire field of conservation for me for the very first time. Um, I just thought pieces magically appeared in museums. I had no idea that there were people in the basements of museums or offsite actually <laughs> working really diligently to, to make it possible um, for an artifact to appear on display. And so part of coming into this work, however, in the context of a movement for Black liberation has allowed us to actually look into this industry and look into this field from different lenses. And how do we actually um, do our work in such a way where it brings the field and the industry along in that conversation of how whiteness has been a part of um, this industry and in ways in which we are working to change that through um, our work here at the George Floyd Global Memorial. Um, to begin, I wanna give you all some context in history of uh, where we work. 38th in Chicago, um, the square, the making of a memorial. So I'm gonna show photos as I talk. Um, so on May 25th, 2020, George Floyd was lynched by the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, on May 26, 2020, the community came together and uh, began to grieve publicly. This was the first iteration uh, of the memorial. It, what was fascinating was that people started to come around a garbage can, a public garbage can that uh, that was laid, that was right on the curb and people started to lay offerings on the curb, not at the exact spot where George Floyd uh, was murdered, but uh, relatively near it. And it is custom in, uh, in black traditions when somebody dies um, 
unexpectedly that memorials are kind of are built in the places of where they died, especially in public places. And so as the community started gathering together to acknowledge to lay flowers and teddy bears and balloons um, and protest signs as well, um, because as, as we all can remember that the lynching of George Floyd actually triggered several protests, um, people would actually write their protest signs, march in a protest, come back to 38th in Chicago and lay them down on the street. Um, the space became a sacred space noted and deemed by the community as a sacred space. Um, the energy in the intersection was different. How people would uh, grieve publicly. I like to say that there's five elements to George Floyd Square at any point in time. Uh, there's community, liberation, uh, public grief, pilgrimage and protest, but really recognizing that it was a place where people could come and heal and be present. Um, the memorial started to grow. So as you can see, uh, there's the garbage can back there. Those original balloons are starting to sink. Um, people now came out and attempted to uh, lay a kind of memorial that would mark out where his body laid. This is not the exact location. Um, and as I've been watching the trial this week, I actually went back this morning and remarked the exact location of where his body laid with fresh flowers um, to ensure that we honor um, the life of George Floyd to the best of our ability in the memorial. But as you can see, there are many signs, protest signs that people were laying in front of Chicago Fire Arts Center, in front of the bus shelter. Um, there were so many and we couldn't um, see them all. So as caretakers, the community started calling us caretakers. Um, as caretakers, we started actually hanging them up on the bus shelter and we started hanging them around the bus shelter and inside the bus shelter to actually um, create as much space as possible for people to view these offerings. Um, people started painting the street, uh, painting the sides of buildings, murals uh, showed up everywhere. Um, this uh, installation is called the Morning Passage. There is a list of 168 names that go down Chicago Avenue uh that speak to people who've lost their lives unjustly by uh the hands of a police department within their community um the say their names memorial was installed and it, it's another 100 names it looks and it feels like a cemetery um where college students came and installed an installation that would give the names dates ages places where people died uh, unjustly. And so what we find in George Floyd Square is not just a memorial to George Floyd, but it's also a memorial to so many people whose lives have been lost unjustly. It's a kind of place where public grief and protest really come together. Um, someone uh, created a, a fist on site. Um, so Jordan Karras Powell, he uh, was from Minneapolis, was living in Denver, flew in town, had a friend design the fist, um, and then they began to construct it on site, left it in the middle of the street. And then the community came and gathered together and carried it from the middle um, of Chicago Avenue to the actual intersection. And it became an anchoring centerpiece as a, as a wooden piece. Um, another organization came in and actually built uh, a food garden that would um, provide food for the community. People, this is Lammy. Lammy has been there since the beginning. Lammy is still in the memorial, I have to say that. <laughs> Some of these offerings, we ensure that they actually live as long as possible um, outdoors before we actually even bring them indoors. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the billboards were taken over. So there's not capitalism beaming down on the space, but it's black art that is created um, and, and engaged everywhere you look. Um, this particular fist actually came from a neighbor who is a builder and he built this in his backyard and he and his friend, it was actually um, a childhood friend of mine, helped him 
um, install this onto one of the bus shelters. And it was a blank piece of wood. And as people came to the memorial, they actually started signing the piece, kids, children, adults, um, and leaving their mark in the square in so many ways. Um, what was interesting about this piece is we actually thought about coding it to protect it through the winter months. Um, and we said no, because it would take the story away and people would not be able to continue to con contribute the story. Um, there were planters built. There were so many plants that were offered as offering and potted plants that we had artists who were out of work because of COVID, theater artists, they actually built these planters custom and then youth painted them um, for them to live outside and actually hold the potted plants that were our offerings for the memorial. And these, these planters are so detailed and each planter actually tells a story and tells a story of protest and black liberation um, and what that looks like and feels like to those youth uh, who were painting and telling their story. If you actually look at the bottom of this one, you see Minneapolis burning. Um, so that was part of their story and what they experienced um, with the uprising. Um, at night, we'd have nighttime caretakers who would go in and light up the morning passage with, with tea light candles. And so the whole street would just be lit um, with candles as people continue to grieve and mourn and process 24-7. Um, we had prayer vigils and gatherings and rallies where people would come and build community um, and be present with and for one another. Um, all of that is happening. This particular piece is um, enamel and steel uh, created by uh, one of our Black elder artists in the Twin Cities area, Esther. And it is the image of a Sankofa bird. And with the Sankofa bird, the feet are facing forward and the head is looking back. And it comes from a West African tradition that has been adopted by many African-American cultures and communities. And what it means is in order for us to know where we are going, we have to be able to look back and understand where we have been. And so this piece really anchors so much Black culture in and um, in, within the square, within the memorial. So the square stands for George Floyd Square. So 38th in Chicago has been nicknamed George Floyd Square by the community. And you may hear me reference, this, reference it as the square for short. Um, for New Year's, we created ice luminaries. We protest with the earth and not against it. And so we use the weather to be able to create beautiful lighting for the memorial. A labyrinth was created with the snow. Um, but the square also, what, what makes the space the space is not just the art that people lay, but the community that people build. We delivered some 6,000 blankets uh, to the community uh, with the sponsor of a, a health organization. Uh, we took another bus shelter and turned it into the people's closet where people can shop with dignity for clothes. Um, and so it's open 24 seven and we care for it, our COVID mindful and clean it through and keep cycling options through for the community to be able um, to shop. Uh, music has come into the square. This is another kind of offering that people give, uh, just being in the space um, and sharing how they're feeling. I call it creative expressions of pain and hope uh, as consists of every offering and also food distributions that we have done in the space. And so all of this is caretaking because when we talk about caretaking, um, it really is two things that anchor us. One uh, is the understanding that everything is somebody's offering, therefore nothing is thrown away. And two, that the people are more sacred than the memorial itself. And so we uphold every offering and every person as sacred, um, and, as this space has been deemed sacred uh, by the community. And so this fist now exists. It's a weathered steel fist that was also created by the original wooden fist um, artist, Jordan. And um, in partnership with Chicago Fire Arts Center, they pulled together a team 
and it now sits in the center of the intersection, um, anchoring uh, the protest, um, but also anchoring community as the community actually worked together to install and lift that up. We used no heavy equipment. It was all people power um, working to install uh, the, the weathered steel fist. So with that, that's kind of introduction um, to the, the square, um, to the memorial, and to uh, what it means for us to be caretakers of this space, of this movement, of this protest. Akoma, I'm gonna kick it to you. Okay, yeah. Um, well, um, I'm just gonna tell you all a little bit about myself and kind of why I'm doing this work. Um, like Josie mentioned, I'm a current graduate student at the U of M studying heritage studies and public history. Um, I've been living in Minneapolis for about seven years now. Um, and during my time here, I've been involved in a lot of youth development, uh, work and a lot of um, community arts programming. Um, but my main uh, work was is in the heritage field and I've been working with the Minnesota Historical Society for some years now. Um, but outside of that, I would consider myself an activist. Um, I was here during the murder of Philando Castile, um, the murder of Jamar Clark, and now the lynching of um, George Floyd. Um, I was outside protesting on the highways every single, every single time. Um, I just felt in my body that I really needed to be out here. I needed to um, give voice to the protest. Um, now, I don't know if you all heard about the incident on one of our highways in Minneapolis where um, there was a group of us on, on the bridge and there was a tanker that came straight through uh, the crowd, um, was speeding um, and had no regard for the people there. Um, people were running, falling on each other. And um, it, it just reminded me of uh, the terror and emotions that um, I've seen in photographs um, of my ancestors who were protesting during um, uh, the beating of Rodney King and after the assassination of Martin Luther King. And then, you know, even, even way back, the ones who marched with Nat Turner, um, it was overwhelming, um, but it was also empowering at the same time. Um, and it was also a reminder that, you know, black communities are grappling with and fighting against systematic um, and institutionalized anti-black uh, racism every day. And, you know, now I was really trying to think about how I can contribute to this movement. And um, I think my way of activism is through and within the cultural heritage field. Um, I, I wanna preserve my ancestor's story. And I know for a fact that in school, all throughout grade school, um, I, they failed to teach me lessons of black oppression and, and also on the other end, black liberation. And it was glossed over time and time again. Um, and I feel like a lot of people really believe that this was, they have an insular way of thinking about this incident, that this was a one-time thing, but no, <laughs> it's been happening for years. Um, but why, why have, uh, as a society, why have we failed to really, you know, deem these stories worthy of preserving. Um, and why is, um, I feel like they come in waves when a situation like this happens, somebody had to, you know, die for um, people to really recognize how important these stories are. Um, so I, I feel like a black sense of place involves a process of materially and imaginatively situating historical and contemporary struggles um, against uh, white oppression and against a lot of the ways that the field has operated in the past. Um, and, you know, I personally, as a black woman within the field, um, I, I know how important it is to bring about social change and community empowerment through preservation work. Um, and that's, you know, why, why this work gets me so excited. 
Thanks, Akoma, for sharing. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about uh, my story and what brought me and got me into this work. Um, and then dabble a little bit into the like decision making process and, and how we get to different things. Um, go into out then we'll, we're going to talk about like the life cycle of an offering. Um, and so then I'll start with like the outdoor caretaking and then moving indoors and then Okoma is going to give us an overview of, of what that indoor process actually looks like and then um, we'll wrap up with um, uh, what's what's next. Oh, and Okoma will also talk about the gallery uh, pop up exhibit that we've installed. And then we'll we'll wrap up with um, what what the future holds for us before we go into Q and A. So um, for myself, I um, I actually wasn't in Minneapolis when George Floyd was lynched. I was in Austin, Texas. I had moved there um, for my own healing journey and process. Um, I had been there for about a year and a half, and because of my work in racial justice. Uh, my family, my mom called me, she was like, Janelle, this just happened like in our community, in our neighborhood. My family home is about two blocks away um, from where George Floyd was lynched. And she's like, I want you to come home. My first response was no. <laughs> but then um, they asked again. And so I said, okay, had one, weeks of, uh, one week of clothes worth of a suitcase. I, I flew on a one-way ticket with on a way ticket to Minneapolis, thought I'd be here for two weeks. And about after two months, I was like, maybe I should move back home. Um, but what happened to get me from just protesting to specifically caretaking as protest was the story of the tanker actually going through the highway that Akoma mentioned. I was actually on the highway and I remember looking up and seeing a truck coming at me and my sisters. And that day, May 31st, was extremely traumatizing. Um, and I woke up the next morning on June 1st, and I said to myself, I know how to tend to a memorial. I've done it before. This is going to be my protest. And I really just started with tending to it, with cleaning and caretaking, um, just making sure the space had what it needed, garbage cans, recycling bins, et cetera, et cetera, because that was before the city started providing those different services. Um, I didn't ever in my imagination think that we would be where we are right now. Um, I, it was more so just thinking that if we are going to protest for justice, if the city thinks that no one's taking care of the space, um, then they're going to bulldoze it. But if we as a community, as um, community members can tend to the space and every day people come and see that it's been cared for, um, then we know that um, it, it at least this will sustain the protests for as, as long as possible. Um, so uh, that's how I began caretaking and the conservation element happened when we were, there became so many offerings that we didn't know what to do with everything. So we think, so we started show, uh, storing them in bus shelters. Um, so I'm gonna actually shift to um, outdoor caretaking um, because part of my story is so connected to that. Um, so we started storing things um, in bus shelters. And what was so funny about it was we were like stacking protest signs. I think we wrapped them in like saran wrap that you use for like moving storage. Um, and we weren't quite sure exactly all that we were doing. Um, but it was like, you know, what? we're just going to do the best we can. Um, and so we tended to uh, the spaces outdoors, we stored things in the bus shelters. And then one day um, a friend said, hey, like I know somebody who's at the Pillsbury House and Theater. Pillsbury House and Theater opened their doors to us to actually have a conservation room or storage room at the time. That's, that's what I understood. We have an indoor space for storage. I was like, great. We get there and then this little lady um, shows up while we were putting the stuff. We had this like designated section of the room and this little lady shows up and she says, stop, if you're going to store them, you're going to store them properly. I had no idea who this woman is or was. And I later found out that she is the director of the Midwest Arts Conservation Center. And that's when I became introduced to conservation. 
and she was just moving so slow and carefully. And we were trying to do an in and out job, like just put the offerings there and then get going. And she was like, nope, that's not what's going to happen. Um, and so we uh, were like, okay, we're just gonna go with it. We're gonna go with the flow. And so we started doing like a weekly lessons in um, conservation. And um, and she uh, was guiding us. And kind of the, the mutual aid exchange that we made was that when she would, she would give us instructions and guidance and facilitation on how to do conservation. And in exchange, we would help her understand how does she practice her work in her field with a lens of racial justice. And so it was a really beautiful partnership um, in that it wasn't just like giving, 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 giving. And it wasn't just taking, 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 taking. Um, and I think that's important when you're talking about a, a equity movement, being able to say, how do we bring um, what we are doing together and leverage our strengths? Um, and so with some photos, um, outdoor caretaking, um, meant a lot of cleaning of the streets, um, a lot of being mindful and careful, especially of the outdoor murals um, and tending to them, making sure that we weren't the street murals, that we weren't brushing too much um, um, of the paint layers of paint off. Um, and we were just extremely mindful about what would actually go in a garbage can before, if we swept a pile, before we actually uh, put the pile in the garbage can, we would actually go through it by hand to, in, to remove any of the tiniest offerings. And our eye has been so trained for offerings that even the smallest of rocks, we can decipher between a rock that's just kicked on the street and a small rock that is actually an offering. Um, here's an image of caretaking. Um, this um, woman, her name is Jeanette, and um, she was caretaking one morning. Um, and this was the 350 potted plants that we had before we actually built the planters. This is, this is why I had the planters built, because there was a lot of potted plants, as you can see. Um, the outdoor caretaking also meant uh, conservation of the mural. So this mural actually got um, tagged and you can see kind of above the head of George Floyd, there's like the red, that's actually part of the tagging that they were moving on. And then in the face, you see some of this red coming down, that's part of the tagging as well. So the gentleman in the orange shirt, um, that's Kadex, he's actually the original designer of the space. And then he had uh, two black women assist him because of the first time the mural was made, the mural was actually made by um, with white artists assisting him. And that was highly problematic for the black artist community because while the black murals were actually grieving the, the death and the lynching of George Floyd, white artists came and decided to throw up a mural within two days of his death. And um, it didn't give an option for black uh, artists to actually have a place in that. And we I actually had to hold five forums to actually help do a restorative justice process to help repair the harm done to the black muralist community because the way whiteness moves so fast into the space that it didn't allow for black voices to be centered and black artists to be centered. So as part of the conservation and restoration process, it was actually required of the artists to actually have um, black assistants restore the mural um, because it was a request of the family that the mural would actually be restored as is. We did also have to fix the face of the portrait because the original image um, made George Floyd look uh, jaundiced and it was more of a caricature of George Floyd and not a portrait. And so a lot of the black artists caught that his lips were way too big for the size of his face. His eyes were way too squinty. Um, it did not look like George Floyd. And so that was a huge piece of what the black muralist critiqued because when you're dealing with this kind of grief and this kind of pain, the last thing you need is a caricature of the image of the man who died um, being spread around the world as opposed to an appropriate portrait. Um, the, uh, we built a greenhouse 
to conserve the plant, the potted plant offerings and the planters throughout the winter. And it is our miracle space. This is something that the community came together. Um, I have a neighbor who's a framer. I have another neighbor who's a builder and who has worked on farms and they picked out all the materials, caretakers did a fundraiser. The community came together and built a greenhouse right in the middle of the street. And Chicago Fire Arts Center actually heated the greenhouse with their electricity and another neighbor came and actually provided the heaters. We also navigated um, outdoor conditions, not only snow, but arson. Um, someone who doesn't like the fact that the memorial is there, actually after the first snow set fire um, to the bus shelter where we were storing offerings from the first snow. Um, a lot of the offerings that were on canvas and everything just absolutely disintegrated. Um, the pieces that we could find that were left, we actually did bring into indoor conservation. Um, and a part of what makes these kinds of decisions of when we bring things in versus when we keep things out is, is really the conditions, the weather, the environment. Um, but we recognize that things are first and foremost laid for protest. And so we want to honor that and offer that. Um, this is when we store things in a bus shelter. Uh, you can see they're wrapped in saran wrap. Y'all, we was just doing the best we could. This is when I didn't even know conservation was a thing. These posters probably had water all in them. Um, I had no idea that molds could grow um, on cardboard. Look, at this time, I didn't even know that cardboard was acidic. There is so much that I have learned in the last 10 months um, just by working with the Midwest Arts Conservation Center on how to care for protest pieces. But the thing with protest pieces um, is that they are first and foremost protest pieces. When people lay things down as an offering, our goal is not to swoop it up and bring it indoors. Our goal is for it to live as long as possible outside um, to tell its own story. And then once it's, uh, it can no longer be held down on its own, whether the wind is blowing it, Chicago Avenue acts as a wind tunnel, um, or the flowers that may have been holding it have decayed and been composted, um, or maybe it's gone through so many rains and storms um, that the, um, the medium is starting to deteriorate. And therefore um, we make a call to actually bring it inside because somebody else would actually think it's trash and throw it in the trash. And I know this because I have gone dumpster diving on multiple occasions for multiple offerings. And so if we as caretakers have a commitment that everything is somebody's offering and therefore nothing is thrown away, we had to get creative and find a way to actually begin not just the preservation of the story, but the conservation of the pieces. And so when we, the, this is the picture of the first day we came into the Pillsbury House and Theater. We laid all of the pieces down that we were able to lay down. Um, this was the area that was designated for storage. I thought we were just gonna continue to stack them. Um, but Nicole was like, nope, we lay them down, we dry them out. We have a place for things that are damaged, that are dirty, that are clean, that are blanks, that, that are, um, um, that are moldy and need attention. Um, and then everything that was wet got laid out flat until they can dry. And then we set up fans and let them dry for a week. And then we came back and began to work on them. Um, and um, this is a, a, a larger view of the classroom on that first day. You can see we couldn't lay all of them out. Um, we still had several wrapped up. And so it, it began a, just a commitment of once a week we would come in and the Midwest Arts Conservation Center would help the community members do their own conservation. Now we have done a lot of work and Acoma will go into this, um, but now the indoor space, um, I wanted to include these photos of like the dream catcher. Um, where this was outdoors. And um, it, we actually, I was trying to keep it outside for as long as possible because it's so big. I was like, I, I knew we didn't have any space here um, indoors for it. And then one day a community member saw it as trash and started breaking it up and throwing it away. And someone told her like, no, you can't do that. Um, and so we brought it in and it became a huge task to, um, untangle the dream catcher. 
Um, and it took a few different tries. And then one of our community members came in and he has a mastermind for puzzles. And he just allowed gravity to work itself out and to allow the dream catcher to actually spin its own self out of its tangle. And that's how we were able to undo um, the dream catcher and, and label it. And then when we stored it, we actually stored it in folds, putting layers of, of foam um, in between each layer so it, it doesn't retangle. Um, or when we would bring them in, we would lay pieces out. This is all one collection. So we wanted to make sure that everything stayed together. This actually came off the base of the fist when we were removing the wooden fist and installing the, the weathered steel fist. Um, this was a section that was on the wooden fist. It would have continued to live outside to this day, um, except for the fact that the reassembly would not have been able to happen. Um, and so we decided to actually bring it back, bring it inside to do a full conservation process. Um, and I think also with the this piece here in the center that is weaved, I'm see if I can blow this up, there we go. This piece here looked like it had started to have mold on it on the backside. Um, and so because that element was having mold on it, but we decided to bring the whole story inside and not just bring one element outside and, and separate it from its family. We did not wanna do that. Um, and so here's a photo. Uh, this was at the end of January of, of the pieces that we've uh, had been conserving and then the pieces that we have inventoried. Um, but I'm going to end my element there and allow a coma to go more into the in-depth process of what happens once we bring offerings inside of the Pillsbury House classroom. A coma, you're muted. Great. Hi, you can hear me now, right? Okay. Yeah. Oh, a coma, I think you just froze on us. Koma, do we still have you? Okay. So what I will do in the interest of time while we're waiting on a coma to get back, um, I will, let's see. Okay, I think she may log out and log back in. Um, so one of the things that uh, we were going to talk about um, later, and I'll just do my part now and Okoma can do it later, was um, uh, what the most important lessons of conservation has been for us. Um, and so I think uh, for me, I've, I, first of all, because I never really had engaged this field before, I, I've learned a lot about conservation first. I learned that tape is the enemy. Um, I did not know that tape was the enemy. And I used um, all kinds of tape when I was outdoor caretaking for a time. Um, and then I get into conservation and they're like, no, we don't use tape. Like they, they took me on a tour of the conservation center and there are literally signs that said no tape. And I'm like, my bad, like <laughs> I am starting from ground zero. Um, but uh, that's that's one of the lessons I learned. So Akoma's back, so Akoma, I'll let you share the screen and continue, and then okay. we'll come back. I apologize for all of that. Hopefully you can still hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, thank you, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, once inside, um, uh, <laughs> once inside, offerings are then assessed and cleaned, treated, housed, and inventoried. Um, Janelle kind of went through that. Um, and 
you know, they're giving a they're given a permanent home and a resting place within um, our little conservation room. Um, people, you know, like Janelle mentioned, they leave a whole wide range of things, including flowers, protest signs, rocks, um, artwork. Uh, a whole bunch of things. So these obviously consider, or you need to consider different conservation treatments for all of these. Um, now, first, when, when an offering is brought inside, we have to assess, will it only need surface treatment or will it need re mold remediation? Now, if it does need mold remediation, um, we isolate those and then um, uh, do treatment with isopropyl and ethanol. Now, let me be very honest with you all. I have no conservation background until January. So this was all a new learning process for me. Um, like I said before, I am a public historian, um, but this was all, uh, all new to me. Um, and when I first arrived, I, I noticed a lot of the offerings had dirt on them. And um, my immediate response was, okay, we have to clean this off. Um, but of course, that's also a part of the story. Um, so, you know, you, you have to really balance what um, is needed in terms of treatment and what isn't. Um, a lot of signs um, are worn, they have been weathered, they live outside. So um, there's staining that happens, um, there's uh, tearing, there's crumpling. Um, and you have to really assess like, is this, um, does it need treatment in terms of aesthetics, in terms of stability? Um, there's a lot of delamination. So you have to really be careful um, in telling that story and letting that offering tell you what it needs and what it doesn't need. Um, now, after they are surface cleaned, um, we then create storages for them. So we do a lot of measurements on cardboard and create um, boxes um, and we line them with acid-free paper. Um, and then we, we lay an offering and then we have another layer of um, acid-free paper and, and put another offering in there. So they're not touching. Um, and, you know, we are very grassroots. So um, it's, you know, we start, you know, with literally nothing. We have to do this all by ourselves. Um, and then after they are stored, we do inventory and we've been using FileMaker Pro um, as a way to organize what we have and what we don't have um, or, or what, what needs to be conserved and, and the treatment that's gone on. Um, previously. I have had some issues with FileMaker Pro. I don't know if you all have. Um, it's crashed on me a few times. Um, so I, and, and we've lost data. So I've had to go back and um, reassess. Um, and, you know, those accession numbers are super important um, with going back and, and retracing our steps. So um, we had to do a lot of troubleshooting um, and it's been, it's been a struggle. Um, I know Janelle was mentioning um, some of the struggles, outdoor caretaking, it's the same indoors. Um, and after we do that, we do um, condition reporting and accession numbers and, you know, we're off to go. Um, I don't know if Janelle mentioned this, but as of now, we have about 2,200 pieces that are indoors. Um, now, outdoors, there's a lot more. Um, and we've, we've gotten through, we've gone through about, ooh, I would say about 400 thus far. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a working progress. We have a lot of volunteers coming in to do also accessioning as well. Um, all right, so um, Janelle and I, well, Janelle had, had the idea of creating a pop-up um, exhibition within um, the George Floyd Square, Square which was um, additional to the Living Memorial. Um, and uh, we decided on having about 200 of those offerings displayed within the gallery. Um, it was hard actually to even find a space within the square to, to have this pop-up exhibition. Um, we wanted to do a, another gallery space, um, but the owner was, <laughs> uh, he, he told us that he wanted to 
have us pay lease um, thousands of dollars per month. And his response was, well, you're making money as a memorial anyway, right? And yeah, <laughs> it, it's been a struggle. Um, so we ended up uh, partnering with the Chicago uh, Fire Arts Center, um, which is actually right behind that uh, greenhouse that Janelle um, showed. And um, even though it is small, we, we really transformed that space. Um, when I first started putting things on the walls, I've, I've been trained in a gallery sense. And Janelle was like, uh, uh nope, nope, we have to layer these. We have to, you know, make this feel as if it was um, outside. So this is just an extension, right? Um, we had community members come in and help, um, outdoor caretakers come in um, to put some of these banners up. We, we also had to figure out a way how to display these offerings without actually interfering with the piece. So um, as you can tell, we have um, in this picture on the, the, the left, we have these shelves. Um, and we put um, clips around them so we wouldn't puncture any of the offerings. Um, we also had to use a lot of magnets, um, adhesive magnets on the walls and then magnets to hold out on, on the front. Um, we had lovely conservators come in and actually paint those magnets to match the color of the offering so it it kind of looks a little invisible. Um, I learned a lot of tricks in terms of exhibition display um, from doing this. And I thought this was, this was such a great experience. Um, uh, if you can see on the right-hand corner, um, there's a little bit of black lace hanging from the ceiling. Um, Janelle and I came up with with this idea of having this really symbolize uh, mourning and um, black womanhood. Um, we have another caretaker who is um, a black gentleman who when he saw pictures of us laying um, the uh, black lace, he, he was like, hey, George Floyd, like this doesn't seem right. This, uh, he, he played football, like he, <laughs> this is just a little, it doesn't seem to go with the story. So I really appreciated that critique. Um, we're, going, we're going to be changing it, but I kind of missed that um, when we were putting it up. We thought it would be a good piece, but you know, after it being up for a little bit, um, I think we're going to change that. Um, so yeah, we've, we've worked really hard for this. And this has actually been a really powerful experience for a lot of people that are coming into the space. Um, I've been in the gallery for a little bit and we've had folks all over the country actually come in and, you know, really feel this space. There's a, it's small, but there's a lot of energy. Um, so yeah, <laughs> here, let me stop. So I, I'm looking at the time and sorry, y'all, we have stories like 10 months of stories to, to do in an hour. Um, but one of the things I really want to point out is lessons learned about, about conservation and how we're engaging this, this important moment in time within our country. Um, the, the conservation world is an extremely white space that I have, I have been learning. And one of the um, moments I critically remember uh, Nicole telling me a story of how um, Marco, it was his first day uh, with indoor conservation. And there was a piece and it was a double-sided protest sign piece. And, and Nicole was trying to figure out which side is the front, which side is the front, which side is the back. Um, and she was going back and forth with um, another volunteer. And finally Marco spoke up and said, look, when we protest, no justice, no peace is always said first, and that was on one side. And then he said, whatever refrain is always the second side. And so the second side had said, prosecute the police. And he said, it's obvious that no justice, no peace is the front. And that story for me is so profound because if someone is a removed from this collective story of protests for black liberation, um, understanding the offerings, understanding what I call creative expressions of pain and hope um, takes uh, 
education and time spent with the pieces. That is why when we're here with our caretakers, uh, we say, please do not just move through this quickly. Take time, spend the time with the pieces, allow the pieces to speak to you, allow the protests to continue to speak to you, because that is the only way you are, know, you are going to know how to conserve it properly. Um, you'll know exactly how much uh, surface cleaning to do. You'll know exactly how much uncrumpling to do or to not do. You'll know exactly how to restore that piece or to allow it to live in its story. But in, all, in order to do that, you have to acknowledge that the pieces are first and foremost pro, uh, protest pieces and that they are there, they're protest offerings um, and they tell a story. And so the life that they lived outdoors matters. The story, the energy that these pieces carry matters. And our job is not to perfect the pieces and to restore them to their original, um, their original state. Our job as conservators of protest art, of protest offerings, is to uplift their story, is to uplift their voices and magnify them so that other people can continue to experience. For that is why um, uh, for that is the reason why we don't say that we're building a museum, we're building a rememory, we're building an opportunity for people to walk in and recall the history of what happened. That's why the Sankofa bird matters. We want people to be able to understand and know why we are here and remember where we have come from. And that takes a particular eye, it takes a particular lens. And for the black community, it requires us to tell our own story. It requires us to do our own conservation. It requires us from the smallest elements and the smallest pieces to be a part of it, to touch it, to feel it and to uplift it. Um, if we are in a movement for black liberation, that means we have to center black voices even in the work of conservation. Um, I know we only have about five minutes left. If there are questions, I'm gonna check out this chat right quick. Um, or um, if I don't know what we can field in this time, our, our emails are in the chat so people can follow up. Um, but if there's anything that we can respond to, um, we'd be happy to respond. <laughs> I'm sorry yeah. we took so long. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janelle and Akoma. And I also want to thank our um, AIC, FAIC earlier, um, our presenter. My goodness, is she still here with us tonight? Did you want to say something before you? Hi, uh, yeah, still here. <laughs> OK, all right, Elena. So um, again, for any of the folks that joined in late, um, Elena's email is also there. She um, she did mention uh, about a particular um, May 1st and it's in significance with the cultural heritage with the AIC and FAIC. But thank you again for taking the time to share this wonderful uh, initiative, this wonderful um, continuing effort that you all have brought to our attention. And, um, you know, you um, let's see, Elena's calling in from Iowa and Janelle and Akum are calling in from Minnesota. So we do thank you for sharing uh, your time with us as well. Uh, let's take a look at some of the comments. So they would love to hear a part two or a follow up on this talk. Well, maybe you guys have something for uh, WCG for the next season. And uh, what else do we have to say? Um, how are you getting funding for the supplies? Oh, absolutely. Funding uh, is through donations. So if you were to go to our website, georgefloydglobalmemorial.org, um, you can donate uh, to the memorial and um, that's how we fund the supplies. Um, Midwest Arts Conservation Center had been extremely generous um, throughout the first few months when we really didn't have anything coming through. Um, and so we are really grateful for the organization really coming alongside us and uplifting us and supporting us. Um, but we are really being funded by um, individual donations. And then we're also applying for grants to, to help come along that for more long-term sustainability. That's wonderful. So in the chat, I did point uh, George Floyd uh, Global Memorial, the website and a PO box address if anyone's interested. And let's see, so your dedication and energy focus on the stories and accessibility is key to active and useful 
flexible conservation, conservation on your terms. So bravo to, and I'll thank you to the Washington Conservation Guild. You're welcome. We, we want to bring um, wonderful stories. Um, you know, most of the membership isn't always uh, just a group of conservators, uh, folks that are um, friends of conservations, we like to call them. They're interested and just want to learn more. So we, um, we definitely hope that uh, both everyone felt welcome here tonight in listening mm -hmm. to this uh, wonderful presentation. So let's see what else we're hanging with. There, there is a question from Miguel that says, why sure. do you think the Minneapolis Memorial has survived so long? Um, it's community. It is a commitment by the community to tend to it every single day. It is a commitment by the community to hold the space um, in protest. Um, the, the barricades um, are still up. They were put down on June 2nd by the city um, and the community held the space and said, before you remove the barricades, we need uh, the city to practice restorative justice for the community first. Um, and it is in that process of the community being able to care for the space as a sacred space um, that allowed us as caretakers, there's about 20 um, community volunteers, nobody is paid. We all live in our houses, like blocks away within the space. And then we come in and tend to it at different hours of the day. The, it's, it's being intentional about upholding and uplifting the memorial. Um, yes. All right, gang. So unfortunately, it is time to call it short. But I do want to thank um, on the chat, uh, Lestarsha, as she uh, provided some statistics, uh, which I hope some folks got a chance to read. But I know there's so many more questions, but we do have to end it for tonight. So thank you all to everyone for joining us. Thank you especially to Janelle Nakoma for sharing this wonderful information. And if, um, again, hopefully if any folks want to reach out to you, the emails are in the chat box. So we'll leave, so we'll stay open a little bit longer so folks can scroll through the chat. 